I don't want to make the assumption that everyone knows what Reddit is. Uh, I think most <laughs> of this room will. Uh, but I thought there was a really great uh, quote in your book that kind of described it. So I'm gonna, I want to describe it from the book that you wrote, and then I want to hear your take on how you would describe it to someone who's never been to the site. So the quote is, being in love with someone who has a constantly expanding and mostly beautiful multiple personality disorder. Yes. <laughs> how would you describe Reddit? Well, in, in standard interviews, uh, for folks who actually have no clue about Reddit, I say, you know, it's sort of a mirror of the entire internet. It's, you know, kind of a bulletin board site with everything under the sun. You know, it's got the day's news, it's got every shiny meme, it's got every conspiracy theory, um, <laughs> anything you can imagine, you know? Yeah, so let's dig into, you're a full-time journalist. Mm -hmm. When did you decide to take on the challenge of a, of a book? Well, so this is, this is kind of a funny story because I was, uh, I, I took on the idea of this book before it was a good idea for a book. I mean, this was, I, it was back in 2011, and I was a, you know, a young journalist working at Inc. Magazine, and uh, I met with Alexis Ohanian and Steve Huffman on a total whim at South by Southwest, and they were, at the time, working on a site called Hipmunk, which is, you know, a, a travel search site like Kayak. Um, only it searches sites based on the agony they would induce on the user rather than, say, price. Um, and, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't that interested in their little travel site. I was interested in the fact that these two seemingly normal guys built Reddit, which at the time was in the news for, um, I think it was, I can't remember if it was either jailbait or creep shots or a combination of both. Um, but uh, it also was sort of known already as the internet's virality engine. It was something that when one of our articles, you know, as a journalist, when an article would reach the front page of Reddit or um, even the top of a news subreddit or something, it would send so much traffic. We called it the Reddit hug of death, uh, that it would, like, cripple our servers but, you know, give so much traffic. So I, I wanted to know more about Reddit, and I didn't, I didn't get to know that day all the stories, but turns out Alexis Ohanian lived in Brooklyn, as did I, and we were able to like meet up on Atlantic Avenue, have some coffees. I heard the whole Reddit story and thought, this is, this is fantastic. Like just what they went through in the first year of building it alone was such a scrappy, great like garage building a startup story that I pitched them both. I put, pitched Steve and Alexis on exclusively talking to me for the purpose of a book. And so it's been years, like years in the making. So you kind of met halfway through where it is today. Oh, yeah. And, and none of the crazy recent stuff had happened yet. Yeah. And you're at a place that it's also a start in a garage kind of really interesting yeah. start. So when you started to uncover the history of Reddit, you know, you started digging into the book. What was that kind of like look back to that first kind of beginning years of how this site kind of spawned into what it is today? Right. Well, it's uh, those are kind of the nice, friendly, gentle times. Um, and it was fascinating to look back because you see the seeds of how virality works and how um, how things, just little ideas, can kind of take off online in ways that we had never seen before. So, I mean, one of Reddit has two kind of magic secret sauces, right? They're not even secret, but there's the algorithm that powers the front page and everything on the site, you know, from every comment and how the threads are threaded to, you know, just how stuff bubbles to the front page and how much time it is allowed to stay there. Um, then that's kind of coupled with the fact that moderators, any, well, basically anyone on the planet can start a subreddit. But then you have to take on the responsibility of running that thing. You know, you are responsible for its content and for maintaining the rules of that, that little fraction of Reddit. And so having thousands upon thousands of volunteer moderators paired with that algorithm, I think, is what made Reddit so special. And then it allowed us to see in the early days things like there was this great story um, called Mr. Splashy Pants. Are any of you guys familiar with Mr. Splashy Pants? Okay, if you've, if you've heard Alexis speak, you've heard this story probably because he, he loves to tell it. But um, it really was one of the first moments where you could see, okay, like this formula on Reddit is working. And when something becomes popular on Reddit, it's ready for mainstream viewing by everyone else. What had happened was uh, Greenpeace decided to, they were trying to um, like, just basically build some community online around um, whale support and earn money for tracking more whales, um, avoiding Japanese harpooning. And they decided to open up a contest for the internet in general to name a whale. And 
you know, there are like beautiful names that people had submitted. Um, I, I think like one was Kayanama, which means I forget exactly. It means it means something in um, it means like lovely creature of the sea. And someone posted to Reddit, hey, like Greenpeace is doing this campaign to name a whale. Let's name him Mr. Splashy Pants. Go to the site and vote up Mr. Splashy Pants. So of course Redditors did en masse, so did people from Fortune, so did you know, lots of folks. And Greenpeace was not happy about this, but Mr. Splashy Pants did win. And <laughs> And then for a while, uh, Greenpeace had a really good good merch business on its hands with yeah. <laughs> with that one. So we'll get into some of the virality of the site and some of the good and bad that comes with it. But looking back at kind of the from where it started to where it is today, what was the part of the history that surprised you most? Oh, well, I I mean the business story. I'm a business journalist. Uh, the story of Reddit sustaining itself through the years was just consistently sort of the most surprising and fascinating story to me. I think that's one that's little known as well. Um, so Reddit was acquired just more than a year after it was created. It was acquired by, by Condé Nast, um, whose parent company is Advanced Publications. They're known for their shiny, glossy magazines. Um, now, Reddit is not that, but um, it was acquired for you know a little more than $10 million. And, after that point, Reddit was put into the, the Wired office in San Francisco. The guys moved out there. There's you know, four to six of them at a time, kind of in a little conference room in Wired. And they were sort of left to build the site on their own. And miraculously, like that worked. You know, the Newhouse family that runs Condé was pretty hands off with them. Um, you know, they had quarterly meetings and shared goals and that sort of thing. But Otherwise, it was just left to its own devices, and somehow it worked. Uh, when Steve and Alexis, the two founders, left Reddit, it worked. There was amazing growth in the year after they left. Uh, when Condé Nast spun out Reddit from Condé into advanced publications, basically allowing it to operate like a Silicon Valley company and take VC money, which it subsequently did, that still worked. You know, They got a new CEO. They just put in a total outsider named Yishan Wong. And the site kept growing and growing and growing, even operating under a different business model. So watching that unfold, um, I think it was just incredible. And Yishan made some very bizarre business decisions during yeah. his tenure, so. That was gonna be my next question. Yeah. So when Alex and Steve kind of, or Alexis and Steve kind of yeah. left, there was a period where you know, he was in charge. And yeah. there's a lot in the book, and the book goes into the history of, of everything, so I highly recommend it. Um, what were some of those decisions that they kind of had to turn back that you know you kind of uncovered mm. and and now looking at where they are today how that section of the business really took it to again where they are today yeah well i think the funniest one is actually before yushan came in when when the guys were kind of like they were unable to hire anyone there were four guys just basically working on reddit and they wanted you know they wanted anyone they wanted like just another programmer and Condé Nast told them well if you um, if you bump up your revenue make a million dollars for us next year you can hire someone and they were just looking at each other like what and so instead of just shuffling their feet um, they decided to wait for a summer Friday when they assumed that most Condé executives would be off in the Hamptons, and they launched a thing called Reddit Gold, which basically allowed people to give them donations. Um, it was sort of a subscription model, but there wasn't, they didn't really offer anything in exchange for the money yet. Um, and they turned the thing on, and nobody at Condé was pissed because they didn't notice at first, but by Monday they had raised so much money that no one at Condé was upset. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it actually worked, and um, I mean, I a funny, th a little known fact about this, you know, Steve Hoffman, who's the CEO of Reddit now, was not at Reddit at the time, and he told me later, uh, much much later, when I was asking him about this, you know, and he said he was watching from afar, and he thought it was a little embarrassing that they had stooped to this level. You know, these guys are all his friends, but they turned on Reddit Gold, and I said, well, it worked though, and he looked at me and said. Well, it, it did not work. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an interesting piece of like, a lot of when you read the book, you kind of realize that it doesn't seem like everything was always very well thought out. Yeah. And it was more of a, 
they kind of had to just roll right. with what, what happened. Yeah. Um, how do you think that, again, how does that shape where we are today um, in the, the business side of the history? Well, I actually think more interesting than the business side of the history is, and I can get to that too, but is the social side of things. Um, how did it shape internet culture today and how did it shape what Reddit became? I mean, you think about how Reddit was founded as sort of um, this freedom from the press, a uh, place where users have the power to upvote, downvote things and determine what's on the top of every homepage rather than an editor. Um, that sort of was taken to its extreme by this community, which was left to its own devices during those years. And users on the site loved to push and prod at those limits. You know, what was the limit of free speech? What, what is the limit of what we can get away with um, in terms of gore and anything, pornography and ab animal abuse, like a highway crash. It's like, what's the limit of what's allowed? And that's why during those years, the community um, spiraled kind of out of control at times. On the business side, I would say Reddit's kind of been in debt to itself for years, right? Like it has, as soon as you know, Steve Huffman came back more than, I guess, three, three years ago as CEO, and he's got his, he still has his work cut out for him, right? I mean, the site had taken $50 million in venture capital at that time, but, um, and now has taken a great, a great deal more. But he had to hire up from something like 20 some people after a bunch left after he returned um, to the more than 400 it has today. And that's before you even start working on those noxious content issues and building in really reliable advertising to the site. So I want to pivot a little bit to another player besides, obviously, Alexa yeah. and Steve are the, kind of the main two. Yeah. Um, there's one who kind of weaves their way in and out of this book a lot, almost to the point where you know you got to remember it's not fiction. Is um, is it Aaron Swartz? Mm -hmm. So, what was you know his role early on, and then obviously yeah. he kind of had a, a, a sad ending with suicide, kind of towards the end of his time. I mean, with with Reddit, I mean it's a big part of of his story. So, what was it like hearing people? talk about his time yeah. at the company. I have to say as a reporter, that was one of the most interesting um, kind of threads to pull. And then as a writer, one of the most complicated stories to tell. Um, one of the great things about writing this book was that every every person in it is a super complex character. Um, nobody is as they seem on the surface at first, right? Um, because you know, you've got Alexis Ohanian, who's a, like, a great showman and a charismatic dude, but he's He's gone through some really troubling times personally. Um, then you've got Aaron Swartz, who I always, you know, I held him up as sort of this like early internet, like wunderkind. He was like this great hacker with a heart, and he um, obviously had a, had a tragic end. And, and I thought this is a fascinating story, but then I started to hear about the early days at Reddit when he was just 19 years old. Um, he sort of, basically like stumbled into working for Reddit. Paul Graham, who started Y Combinator, suggested that he started working with those guys because his own startup sort of floundered. And he did. And he and Steve rewrote the site into Python. And, um, and then after that, I started hearing that he just sort of stopped, like gradually stopped working on Reddit and started writing a book on childhood development in his room. and. Um, and, and, you know, this all, their relationship got really fractured and I thought, God, this is such a tricky story to write um, because, you know, he's someone so beloved and then to hear that, you know, I heard from many sources that he was one of the reasons that they sold the company so early is they couldn't, like they all couldn't work together anymore. Um, and then, you know, Aaron left shortly after the acquisition. Um, it was sort of amazing that he even stuck around that long, I learned. Um, and I do think he loved he loved Reddit. I do think that part of Reddit's original spirit and its sustaining, you know, its spirit to this day was sort of that that hacker with a glint in his eye, right? That troublemaker, information wants to be free, sort of activist um, behind a screen. And and that's you can see a little bit of his sense of humor and his his passion still in the way the site thinks today. Um, similarly, you can see Steve Huffman's sense of humor in, in the site. I mean, that trollish, like, nothing is as it seems on the surface. Like, that's, that's Steve, for sure. So you mentioned the complex characters. Mm -hmm. As you interviewed a lot of different people for this book, 
Um, how did you piece together what you would hear from the person versus what you're hearing from somebody else explaining kind of sometimes the same story yeah. but hearing very different things to kind of piece together what was the reality? Well, as a journalist, there, there are certain layers of how deep you can go, right? Um, if I'm just working on a news story, a daily news story or something, I just take like that, like what is said and what is like facts at kind of face value. When you're working on a narrative like this, it's so much deeper because you get you get you have to try to get as many perspectives on a situation as possible. Um, there are certain scenes in the book that that read that I was not present at that read like I was present at because I've spoken to so many people yeah. about that moment in time. There are others, by the way, that I was not present at that I simply could put together from a photograph or a video or something, um, which, I mean, it's amazing. This is a book about the internet, and the internet is just riches of documentation. Um, the research was, was so fun and so, um, so interesting at times because I could see a photo from a day and put it together with what people had told me and read someone's blog post about it and check out the Reddit threads from that moment as well and then kind of piece everything together. That said, like, not every source agrees with itself. Um, there were certain facts that, you know, one person would just disagree with. And because I was reporting on things at times that happened 12 years ago, memories are all different. I learned so much about how the human brain and memories work. Uh, everyone, is, I mean, like, everyone is so different in terms of how they process information and how, like, which pieces they retain. Um, so I really had to weigh heavily on people whose memories were, were kind of trust, were, like, lined up at times. And then I knew that their other ones would line up as well, um, or could, I could weigh a little more heavily, or I could, I could, you know, lean on them more heavily. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to switch gears a little bit to sure. the social aspects that you mentioned. Um, Reddit's obviously has a very interesting kind of social aspect of it. Yeah. Some good, some bad. Um, I want to get into a couple that you cover in the book. Some good, some bad. Which would you prefer to go first? Good oh, or bad? I don't care. Yeah, up to you. Up okay. to you. Let's start, let's start with the bad first. All guess, right. We'll, we'll be a little bit more uplifting after. I think the uh, doxing, yeah. which is uh, sharing someone's personal information online. And I think the moment that it really highlights in the book is with the Boston bombing suspects. Yeah. So what was it like kind of looking back on that, I mean, national, I mean, almost global history moment and how Reddit's played a huge part in it? Yeah, when the Boston Marathon happened, I was actually working at CBS News. I was a writer for Katie Couric. And so if you're in a newsroom, you kind of sit, um, you sit with a computer in front of you and like a row of TVs above your head and I, you know, sat there just watching everything, and we were reporting on it simultaneously as everyone else was. And this was, I think, kind of America's introduction to Reddit. This was the time our parents first heard about the site, um, because it was actually a bunch of reporters who were tweeting stuff from Reddit and spreading around little bits of misinformation that they didn't didn't know were unreliable, um, that, that fed they kind of fed the beast and fed that hype cycle. Um, and the news moved so fast uh, that, I mean, it was a tricky thing because, right, like Reddit had actually solved like crimes in the past. It's the place where you go if you, you know, get hit, if your vehicle's parked and gets hit and run and you've got a little piece of the tail light of the other car, someone out there on Reddit like will identify that and you can give that to your police department. I mean, that's happened so many times. So when it came to this higher stakes situation um, with Boston, I mean, it was just, it's like horrifying to think of that family that was hurt. I'm not sure if you guys all know the story, but basically a suspect was like misidentified. And um, it was a student, a young student named Sunil, who had disappeared from his university. Um, he looked, a, he looked physically just kind of resembled one of the actual suspects, the actual brothers. and. Um, you know, by the time his family was basically just harassed and um, they were already in a place of mourning for her having their son having disappeared, his bod body was later found um, floating in a river and in an unrelated death. So, I mean, it was just like this horrifying thing that Reddit sort of happened to because of the nature of that community. And being able to kind of post anything anonymously, I think like people got really worked up about it. Um, and I think that really highlights 
the incident really highlights how difficult it is to be a moderator in a situation like that. Those moderators were volunteers. They were, by my best estimation, I think a couple of them were really young students themselves. Um, trying to keep up with those instances of doxing and whatnot, it's almost impossible when people jump on it so quickly. And I mean, I think it raises the question, you know, how, how do we do content management and community management in this modern era? Um, how do you manage that kind of bandwidth? Uh, Facebook has had this question repeatedly. Twitter obviously is grappling with it, and Reddit has a fraction of the employees as those companies. It only has 400 and some. Is that weight all on the volunteer moderators? Well, I think that's kind yeah. of the other part of the social maybe bad is when there's right. borderline illegal or sometimes yeah. illegal uh, subreddits that yeah. have popped up over the years that can be started and how moderators have to police that. And I know there's an interesting part of in the book of where they kind of had to almost make a, a decision and draw a bright line. And can you kind of speak to Yeah, that? which decision was it that you're talking about? With I believe it was with the jailbait and some of those other. Um, well, is it the first decision that Ellen Pao made when she was? Yes, there we go. So after Yishan um, Wang left, uh, by the way, that's one of my favorite lines in the book is like that. And it's a direct quote from Yishan that his story of leaving the company was unbelievable because it's so weird. Um, <laughs> and. You know, after he left, he, uh, Ellen Powell became became CEO, and she was already deep in her Kleiner Perkins trial. She was testify. She was, you know, set to testify um, while she was at Reddit, and she did. Um, and I think that informed her a little bit in terms of like where we need to start drawing lines online. And um, I mean, it's a tricky. It's a. It's always been a tricky issue for Reddit because it's always been known as a haven for free speech. And to say, no, we are not, we are cutting off these noxious communities was a really, really tricky thing. Um, so she basically tasked her community manager, um, the, the head community manager, with identifying five subreddits. Say, OK, we're just going to cut them off. And that was um, one of them, most notably, was fat people hate. That was a very sizable community. And so on that day, they actually did just make an announcement, cut off the communities, uh, managed those sort of same communities popping back up under new names, you know, fat people hate too, we dislike fat people, or whatever, you know. Um, it wasn't super savvy, but of course people <laughs> tried. Um, you know, after they, they kind of cut off the next waves, then they did see, and this was not until years later that we could really document it, but researchers have found that the simple act of cutting off those five first subreddits has improved kind of the quality of speech on Reddit throughout the site. You know, you think of all this uncivil, discivil discourse um, that's kind of plaguing the internet right now. It actually, like, demonstrably improved that throughout the site. So years later, and this wasn't until I think a year or two ago that this research came out, um, like, it's shown that Ellen Pau did, did accomplish what she set out to, despite the crazy backlash to it. So let's switch gears to some of the good. Um, the Reddit GIFs, which is kind yeah. of its own business, but yeah. I think the most recent stat I saw was at the 10-year mark, it was $29 million worth of yeah. GIFs. Yeah. Um, how did that kind of, again, the social impact of that culture that was self-created and then turned into its own business as a piece of the company? Totally. And it's got its own really interesting history being in a separate right. location and all yeah. those different pieces. Um, yeah, so Reddit GIFs was was actually not created as part of Reddit at all. It was created by this guy named Dan McComas um, out of his home uh, with his wife. And eventually it became such a load for him to bear that he, he went to Reddit and said, like, I can't do this anymore. And um, you know, somehow, miraculously, they, they convinced Condé Nast to also, you know, Reddit to acquire Reddit gifts, and I mean, this just shows how crazy and convoluted everything was. But but do I don't know why? I mean, I do a, a slightly, but it's kind of a long story. Reddit gifts was not allowed even in the office um, to work with Reddit after it was acquired. They were real. <laughs> they were kept, you know, at a distance. Um, that's sort of flipped at one moment in time when when Yishan recognized, I think Yishan and Ellen together sort of recognized, hey, this part of the business could make money. They started um, suggesting gifts to buy and advertising on the, the market. They created a marketplace for gifts and actually started to make money. By that time, Dan and his wife had moved to Salt Lake City because um, they were so starved of resources that they couldn't afford to live in San Francisco anymore, which is crazy. 
Um, I mean, I know it's an expensive city, yeah. but <laughs> so they're working in like a three hundred dollar a month rented little tiny space behind a like near a Dunkin' Donuts where they're hearing the drive-through um, voice all day long, and they start to manage to make money for Reddit. One of the first times Reddit has had significant actual income. Um, but yeah, Reddit gives it's like this very uplifting uh, story of individuals kind of creating what I call the daisy chain of goodwill. You know, you send a gift anonymously to someone um, that you're given. You can kind of stalk their social presence. You can check out who, what they might like. Um, and then that person who's also signed up for gifts sends a gift to someone else. And um, yeah, it's massive. It's massive. Yes. Another kind of fun social one is the Ask Me Anything yeah. kind of subreddit. That's obviously a really big piece of yeah. the site. Um, I think, are you going to be doing one, correct? Yes, I'm going to do one on the 11th. You guys should. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. also has its own history. It was run by one person. And then there was someone working full time bringing, uh, bringing celebrities on and bringing guests on. And now kind of respond to what it is today. Yeah. But the social good that has come from that subreddit, can you speak a little towards that? Right. I guess I feel like um, AMA is just is Reddit's like brightest, shiniest, most celebrity centric thing. It's a lot of people's gateway to Reddit itself. Um, and I just, I love that every every scientist and everybody studying something super niche, um, everyone who's had a bizarre medical condition or um, strange life coincidence can just get on Reddit and say, you know, AMA, I had a belly button transplant, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and you know it's it's over the years everyone from president obama to i don't know who's the craziest what's your favorite ama who I, I thought the obama was really interesting yeah some of the kind of bizarre medical ones are really right really interesting <laughs> to read um, but yeah i mean there's it's just a, a rabbit hole yeah no yeah i love that um that vacuum repairman was the most popular ama for so long because you know people just google like what's this valve in my vacuum? And yeah. <laughs> they come up with a vacuum repairman and can't take their eyes away from it. Um. <laughs> so let's pivot about to more where they are today. So there's obviously a big piece about the redesign of the site and yeah. the app and also just the, uh, you know, adding ads and just kind of all the different pieces of the business now. Yeah. You know, how, how did you take kind of where they are today, where you think they're going, and especially the redesign piece, which was a pretty big shift for the business? Yeah, so when I started reporting on the book, Reddit had like 20 employees, maybe, and they were spread out on over different cities. Um, and so seeing in the last three years, Reddit become kind of a legitimate big business, like a legitimate Silicon Valley fast growing company valued at more than a billion dollars has been super fascinating. Um, I watched them switch offices. They're now at this big, cool office at 420 Taylor Street. Um, and I mean, despite that it's kind of in the tender line, it's like, it's, it's a pretty nice office. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, it's, Reddit was, I think even, even two years ago, even one year ago, really it looked like 2005 had invaded your desktop when you went to reddit.com. Um, my favorite quote about the way Reddit looks was from Bloomberg Business Week. They said it had all the aesthetic seduction of a phone book. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, dystopian Craigslist is my other favorite description of what Reddit looks like. Um, but you know, within the last year, they've undergone a site redesign that's really kind of complete. It's taken every page and turned it into something that, um, you know, when I was at South by Southwest this last year with Steve Huffman on the main stage, I asked him, I was joking with him about the redesign, and I, um, I asked him what it was going to look like when it was done, because it wasn't done yet. He said, oh, it'll look just like Facebook. <laughs> and like, half the audience laughed, and then there was kind of a pause, like, really? And you know, now it honestly, it does. It's like white and blue and like blocks, um, movable blocks of text and images. And you use the app, mm -hmm. you see that it's like a lot of big squares of memes and photographs and videos, scroll, like infinite scroll, super fast scroll. So. Um, so it's a new sort of Reddit now, and with that redesign, they would like to retain some of that original anarchist spirit of Reddit. Um, they want to retain some of that, like, Aaron Swartziness of it, right? The like, I that that like rebel feeling. And so, even during the redesign, you know, they brought in a bunch of staff from Microsoft and from where else did they hire designers from? Um, 
forget the uh, from big companies basically who people who had done big big you know tech company designs before and when when Steve Hoffman was presented with some of their mock-ups for the new site he would even he would bristle you know like he created that original ugly reddit and you know redditors themselves are very used to this really tight design where like the site is cluttered and it's kind of ugly and they kind of loved it for that. So it was a difficult process, just like any any tech site redesign. Um, but Steve actually would tell them sometimes, can you just remove some of that white space? Or can you just chisel that around the edges a little bit? It looks too nice. Um, so it's it's a work in progress. And um, they're like, you know, as a company, they're retaining the ability for users still to revert to the old design so as to not alienate users too, too much. Uh, but that said, like this Reddit, today is trying to move into the future. It, it would like to be to have its users be a little less anonymous, I think. Um, you have the ability now to create a profile page. On that profile page, other users can see the top five subreddits you visit. So there's a little less anonymity, even when you have a, you're hiding behind a username. So um, you know, Reddit's opened up the door for brands to post, for media companies to kind of get involved more overtly. They would love for every celebrity to have an account and be super public. They would love for Elon Musk to be not just tweeting or posting his rocket videos on Instagram. They would love for that content to come to Reddit first and then spread out over the web. Um, so for Reddit to turn into more than just kind of a melting pot for the stuff of the internet and a virality engine, they want to be the originator of that content. And so that's what we will be watching over the next few years, I think. So your book obviously is a probably a to be continued because there's obviously an ending. <sighs> what's the one thing that didn't? As if I hadn't make, been working on it long yeah. enough, right? Well, uh, what's the one thing that didn't make it into the book that you know you? you there's a million you. things. There's a million things. I know way too much about all of these guys. Um, <laughs> but oh gosh, there were there were some. I mean, there's so, such great cultural stuff that happens on Reddit. All the April Fool's Day, like those those little. Pranks, and I mean, they're not even pranks now. They're full blown internet stunts. You remember um, Place, where you, anyone could put any pixel on a, on a canvas? And it was sort of this like cringe moment on the internet, on the internet where everyone was like, is it going to be just swastikas and like penises, or is it going to be a beautiful canvas full of like interesting thoughts and different communities coming together? And we got to see sort of, again, a mirror of the internet happen. I had this very long scene about that that nobody wants to read, I'm sure. Um, and uh, same, with, same with the button. I loved the button. I don't know if you, do you remember that one? No? Eh. Um, I do want to open up the audience questions because yeah. I know we have a lot of people in here. So yeah, a lot of people line up. I will do a few rapid fire real quick while people are lining up. Uh, favorite Reddit scandal you covered? Favorite scandal? Gosh, I didn't like any of them. Um, I mean, I did, but they're all like traumatizing in their own way, right? I mean, I think I did some great reporting around the what's called AMA Geddon. Um, you guys may remember when an employee named Victoria Taylor was sort of unceremoniously dismissed from her role, and the internet like snuffed out, well, Reddit snuffed out. Um, that was a great like revolt of moderators against the site that they created and that harbored them, um, and a fascinating moment. And I think it it's one of those things that's like it's a, a few years in the past, um, but I sort of figured out what actually happened, what actually transpired there. So I guess that was that was kind of fun. Favorite subreddit. My gateway subreddit when I started reporting was definitely like. Well, there were a couple. I think Shower Thoughts and Mildly, like, Mildly Interesting was my gateway. I just love, like, the dumb photos of, like, my gummy bear has two heads, you know? I, I, like, <laughs> um, favorite AMA guest? I don't know. I love, I, I mean, Bill Nye, right? Like, he used to be so good. Now he's, like, not as great, but, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, there's so many good ones. Yeah. Like, like, anytime, like, like the, the X Files were like they like did so many repeatedly good ones with Victoria. That was always great. And last one, sort by new or sort by popular. <laughs> I just I mix it up. It depends what I'm looking for, right? Like yeah. you're always looking for the best. Like if if you're a lurker, you're kind of looking for the like to get the best of like his like history of a certain time. So. 
Yeah. A, a lot of questions, so yeah, let me start over here. Reddit's not entirely original, right? We've had Slashdot, where you could upvote comments. Uh, we've had 4chan, which was, uh, has also produced a considerable amount of viral content and also is full of terrible content. Um, so why did Reddit succeed where others before it had failed? Yeah. Um, well, so Reddit was actually designed um, after the Delicious Popular page. I don't know if you know that. It was sort of like just a clone of that, um, which is crazy, because Delicious didn't even make it um, in, in a substantial way, um, as its original vision, at least. But um, I mean, Reddit, Reddit was sort of the best of like all the worlds. And sadly, I mean, 4chan was, was started by Chris Poole. Like, he just couldn't, he was one guy working on it alone. He couldn't really sustain that. Um, and it really spiraled way the heck out of his control. So I, I mean, um, it was never really a company either. He didn't, I mean, he just didn't want it to be. So that's, that's fine. Um, Reddit had enough of a company to it. Like, it, it had enough of a backbone. Um, and just like such a great community of moderators through the years. I don't know, I mean, it's like amazing that it made it, right? It, there's like so many times during the book where as a reader, like in a, well, working on it, but as also like reading it, it's like, how did it possibly come through? And that's one of the main reactions I'm, I'm getting to the book, um, like from readers, which is why I kind of stated that answer in that weird way, um, is like, how did it make it through? But yeah, by a hair. It did, and it's still, like, there are still really, really substantial challenges, I think, that it faces. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned the, the redesign. Yeah. It's very interesting stuff. So I want to say about a month ago, there was a post on Data is Beautiful. Mm -hmm. it was, obviously, there's some, some uh, response bias here, but it was a survey about uh, use of old.reddit versus www.reddit. Yeah. And about 80% of responders said they still use old.reddit. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. That doesn't surprise me. So it doesn't surprise you. Yeah. And, and you've spoken to these people. Why yeah. are they so confident in it? <laughs> <laughs> if 80% of responders say they yeah. still use the old version? I mean, they're they're confident in their own work, right? I mean, they work there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, at, at one point when I was interviewing Steve Huffman uh, on stage, he, I think we were, I don't know what I was talking to. It, it may have been a design thing. Like, I was speaking kind of critically of it. And he said, well, Hey, come on! I work there, you know, <laughs> and you know they they believe that they need to move into the future. I think they've seen Reddit kind of left in the dust by the rest of the internet in terms of design, amongst other things. Um, you know, content was obviously another area where they were slow to act and slow to put into policy certain certain behaviors that they needed to. Um, so the redesign, I think, is it's simply like. Steve has a mandate from his board to get to a billion users, and I don't think he believed, I'm not sure, I don't mean to put words into his mouth, but he and his team like didn't believe they could do it looking like 2005 on your browser. So you think the 2005 yeah. option will remain even if it's not the default? Oh, interesting. I know, I know. Everyone wants to know that, right? Yeah, well, um, you have a lot of inside information, right? I don't have that inside information. Um, I will ask next time okay. I talk with them, because I, I mean, yeah, it's- I will reiterate the question on the AMA. Thank you. <laughs> we should, and we can get Spaz to comment, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of the stories you told seem to sort of illustrate some of the moral hazards associated with this kind of really anarchic internet yeah. uh, presence. And I thought that the story you told about Ellen Powell was interesting because it says that, like, actually, the leadership of these sites can have a really big influence on the kinds of communities that develop. Uh, and the leadership of other large social media sites have sometimes had great influences on. Uh, on their communities and sometimes bad ones. And so I'm curious, like, how seriously does the leadership of Reddit right now take, like, the extent to which Reddit has been involved in, like, fostering a modern, like, you know, violently misogynistic yeah. white supremacist movement, which yeah. has largely developed in the shadows of Reddit and other places, too? This is a huge question on my mind, too. And I've tried to get to down to it through my reporting over the years. Um, you know, it's like, they will address it with me, and we do talk about it. And um, and I do think that they have been. I mean, they jumped on the like the obvious alt right subreddits uh, fairly quickly. I mean, they were the stuff was there and it was brewing, but obviously the Donald is just this huge question for them. It's got more than six hundred thousand subscribers now, and still harbors in its sort of network of adjacent communities a lot of the worst stuff like the worst speech we see online. And it's um, it's so tricky. I, I think that Steve still believes that 
they have a right to political speech. And now that we are in an era where, you know, the things that the First Amendment was meant to protect, politi namely political speech, is um, is sort of at times intersecting with or the ident the same thing as hate speech. Like these these sites, like and their leaders need to address that and draw. I think draw like firmer lines on it. I think that um, it's a huge question for for regulators and for you know our our government as well. Um, despite that, that's a, a tricky thing that you know in the business you don't really want you don't know whether you want to be regulated. Um, it's something that it, I think people need to speak to their representatives about if they feel strongly about it because it is not happening at the pace that speech is evolving online, um, which whatever way you feel about regulation versus, you know, a business handling this stuff on their own. Um, but but yeah, it's it's a huge, huge issue. And it's still there, right? So. Uh, thank you so much. This is really interesting to hear about the business history of Reddit. Um, so I think on subreddits that aren't explicitly um, like female oriented, there's often an <laughs> implicit assumption um, that you're male. Um, yeah. And comments can be kind of quick to jump to sexist or objectification or something. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Has there was there any discussion inside about um, either making the culture by default more neutral or more uh, female friendly, or um, any sort of consciousness um, internally about that? Yes, there is a great consciousness internally that I've seen about it. Um, I. I, again, it's an uphill battle for them, um, but uh, I mean, like, still, I think 60 or more percent of redditors are male, 65, I think, um, and you can tell, right, when you're even still, they've made a great effort to reduce casual misogyny on the site, um, and I, I think, for me, it's, I can look back now, you know, years ago, um, I think it was maybe five, five or more years ago, I mean, the culture on the site was so much kind of worse than it is now that um, a business manager of Reddit in a casual press interview encouraged all women to completely stay away from r slash gaming because it was simply too abusive. I mean, can you imagine that? Um, and even on, I mean, today, even on like, even on 2X chromosomes, you can get harassed for being a woman. It's, it's crazy. I just saw a couple of weeks ago a woman posted something about um, she was having a really bad week and then she, you know, kind of scrappily like fixed, like you looked at a YouTube video and fixed her, her parents' dryer that was broken on her own, went out and bought the part. And then you just have people bashing her saying like, why would a woman even try to do such a thing and questioning her abilities. And, you know, it's, it's um, the way Reddit is set up with moderators um, volu who volunteers being responsible for kind of keeping all of that content. Um, how they see fit in their little box of Reddit, it's it's so tricky to regulate anything that's not strictly kind of hate speech, and they're still drawing drawing new lines. Um, so much so much the way we talk online exists in a gray area, and I don't know. I mean, even personally, I, I question like I used to. You know, I was educated as a journalist, and really used to. You know, part of the foundation of that was like I believe people should have the information they want, and people should be able to speak how they want. And now again, that you know, the, like hate speech can be synonymous with political speech or with a casual statement. Like, yeah, how do we go forward? Do you have, like I don't know? Feel free to ask a follow-up question or say what you think about it because I think it's really complicated. I think even if sixty-five percent is a majority, it's actually not a very big majority. Right. And I think I had seen a statistic about how it's really not as skewed as people perceive it to be. Yeah. So I sort of wish that they would publicize more, that it's like, yeah. just don't, you really don't need to assume. I have it 65, this is brand new, 65% male, 35% female. By age, majority of our audience is under 34. Quarter of the audience under 24. Um, first off, just want to thank you for being here. Um, thank you for being here too. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been definitely really interesting. So you talked about um, the horrible doxing and misidentification that happened um, with the Boston bombing, um, and then you look at something like, um, for those of you who don't know, there was a mass shooting in Jacksonville um, yeah. at a Madden tournament, um, and there's yeah. a really big overlap in those two communities um, with you know like Reddit and gamers and all of that. So there was a really big subreddit, um, a few of them, um, that popped up around that, trying to almost do the same thing. Yeah. Um, 
and those got shut down very quickly by internal moderators. Yeah. You said they're all volunteers. Admins are like the, you know, there's an internal community team, um, which is more substantial today than um, than ever, but I would say like shockingly small. Well, that that yeah. actually really was my question. Yeah. Was, um, had just like, what do you know about that internal yeah. community team? If you can share anything about it, um, about its growth and about kind of the strategies around that. Um, in ways that those things are being handled post um, Boston Marathon. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know exactly how big it is today, but um, about uh, more than a year ago, I sat in on a meeting with uh, about twelve of the community team members and um, got to know them and their jobs. And they each sort of have like they each have like a purview, right? There's like one who works on like our books and our AMA, and there's um, there's two who kind of manage like the like most um, passionate political speech. Uh, they're like the most familiar with the Donald. Uh, I have quite a bit of their storyline in the book. You should check that out. Their names are adorably Bill and Susie. Um, and, and they each have like really crazy stories of how they, um, how they came to Reddit and came to work together also. Um, and you know, it's, it's a team that's evolving and it's a team that, um, is is like very tight and tight knit, and they work hard together. They have so there's so you think of this community team, right? They're like good cop, right? They're like working. They're communicating with their usernames. They're well known people. Like if you're a real redditor, um, and uh, say there's a couple dozen. I don't know exact the exact number, or whatever. But then you've got the a, a team that's sort of their secret counterpart. That's called, um, well, there's two parts of it actually, but there's sort of the, the secret counterpart. Literally, like, they are, their identities are not public, like, whatever. They are not known as employees of Reddit. And they are the ones that kind of enact bans and cut off communities and identify communities for, um, for being cut off. And there's, like, just as many of them on staff, which is really fascinating. Um, and then they've got kind of a data side of that team that's just evolving now. That's what you saw last week Steve was referencing in um, his public comments about like how are we going to manage the flow of disinformation in the future from Russians. Um, that's the team that he's talking about. Um, they also, by the way, you might be fascinated to kind of think of Russian influence on the site um, or any disinformation campaign spreading as like just the same as like bots. Um, <laughs> Like, if you can take it down from the side of like it being spam, that's ideal for them. So then part of this team is called Anti-Evil. They, um, which is a great team name, of course, um, and they are the ones kind of that are secret and doing this stuff. You can think of them as, as sort of like bad cop. Um, and then their, the, the, their counterparts um, are, or actually trust and safety is kind of the secret one, and then you've got anti-evil, and they're kind of RoboCop. They build the algorithm, algorithms. They like bust the spam. So you think good cop, bad cop, RoboCop. <laughs> not my not my original um, line, but it's a great way of thinking about how they're structured. As Reddit's gotten more popular, it seems that there's a very obvious play towards uh, a more valuable demographic for advertising yeah. and product promotion. Uh, and it seems that there's uh, a pretty obvious uh, correlation for astroturfed type submitted uh, content, whether that's uh, a company promoting a product or, yeah. or, or uh, some content that they've created or uh, something to political ends of a similar nature. Uh, has there been any, any efforts or any ongoing work towards making sure that it's actually people behind this instead of companies and shadow organizations? Yeah, yeah. Um... I mean, I think I think in comparison, like in contrast to what it could be, Reddit is incredibly good at managing sort of spam and that sort of posting by brands and stuff. I mean, that's a dual um, that's got dual components. It's the community regulating itself, right? People hate seeing that kind of disingenuous. I'm just self-promoting um, kind of thing, and we'll report that on Reddit right away. And also, the teams are very good at at managing bots. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, will we see a little bit more kind of promotional content? I don't know. Yeah, um, but like, this is stealing a line from Steve Huffman. Like, you have to be pretty naive if you think no one's marketing to you already, right? Um, they are. They're just trying to do it in more savvy ways than they maybe could. Um, I don't know. I think that, that we will see more brands actually come to the Reddit way of doing things and being a little more genuine, maybe. If they can just go on and say, like, Hey, want some free stuff? Like, look at this AMA, or we'll give out, you know, 
10 free books or we'll um, give the best person with the answer to this trivia question a free shaving kit. I don't know. I mean, there's like a million ways to actually market on Reddit that aren't gross. So I, I think brands will come around to that. And their ads, their ads like don't look bad under new Reddit. So um, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think, are you seeing more like uh, less feeling stuff? I mean, le less the, the actual advertising that's right. on there. I, I understand that's you know part of the business model and more uh, I guess accounts that are pretending to be people that are upvoted in mass and kind of artificially floating towards the top of the front page that right. are are not just something that somebody found interesting and thought it was relevant and more placed there for a very specific goal, whether that's site traffic, selling products, yeah. et cetera. Got it. I mean they've they're they're pretty good at, at cracking down on nets of individuals who upvote stuff. Um, that said, like even certain, you know, Russian domains can get uh, get past those those filters. So I don't know. I mean I, I think honestly like that's been a strength in the past and maybe it still happens, but um, I think that that is far less of a concern for like me personally or many citizens of the United States than say, you know, Iranian or Russian influence on the election. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Christine, thank you for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it.